Lamia stood up from her seat and walked towards Arik, smiling at the space commander. He looked at Lamia and shook his head. No, 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 all too easy. How did Semele learn to operate the technology aboard that ship if those who knew how to do so have been killed? This doesn't add up. Orak and a ship like the Liberator, too many coincidences for my liking. I'm going out there with a crew of troopers. You should remain here in Space Command, Lamia. This is still a military matter and not yet the time for congratulatory propaganda. Whatever that ship is, we have it. We have Orak, and we have two officers in control of the situation. You can accompany me on my command ship with a crew of troopers if you must, but we will announce this as another success of the expansion programme, and that is final. Go to your quarters and prepare, Space Commander. I want to leave within the next hour. Lamia's intentions were clear to Arik, clarifying his return to a subordinate role in the operation. Jandar opened a chest compartment in her black outfit and walked over to a large stock of tubes containing a green-coloured, viscous liquid. She took one, inserted the tube into the compartment and closed it, sitting back in her chair as she took a deep breath. Her eyes closed briefly and she felt a momentary floating sensation, as if the serum was providing her with the very essence of life itself. At that moment, Semele aimed a gun straight at her Jandar tensed, visibly. What are you doing, officer? Stand down immediately. You are inferior, Jandar, a puppet of the Federation. And so I am going to release you from your pathetic existence and set you free. The shot hit Jandar in the centre of her chest, exactly where she had ingested the liquid. She slumped to the ground and Semele kicked her dead body to one side and sat at the command console. She quickly pressed a few buttons and lifted a lever in the centre of the console. In response, the pursuit ship undocked smoothly and moved exactly 50 spatials away from DSV-4. Before activating the communicator to alert the crew to teleport her, she grabbed the stock of tubes containing the liquid Jandar had ingested and then pressed the switch on her bracelet to open contact. Ensel, bring me back. Arik's reluctant departure from Lamia's office was interrupted when yet again the main monitor on the desk beeped, requesting their attention. He moved back to Lamia's side and they both read the information displayed on the screen in disbelief. Jandar's life signs had been extinguished, just as Camilla's had been. Semele remained very much alive. Furthermore, the pursuit ship's locator revealed it had moved away and undocked from the unknown vessel. Arik and Lamia stared at each other in shock. How can this be, Arik? I told you this was too easy. I also told you to send troops and not mutoids. A look of fury burned in Arik's dark eyes. He opened a channel to the pursuit ship. Mutoid officer Semele, what is going on there? Report! Ensor heard Semele's communication and moved to press the switch that would bring Semele back on board. Tarrant gripped him fiercely and aimed a gun at him. No, you don't. She's a mutoid officer. We can't trust her and we should destroy that ship with her on board. Ensor shrugged. Do you really think I care what happens to her? Ensor stood up as Tarrant placed his gun on the teleport console and began walking towards the flight deck. Just then, Blake entered the room and swiftly moved to grab the gun. Much to Tarrant's surprise, she aimed it at him. Don't make it this way, Tarrant. Whatever you think of Semele, she trusted us and she's done exactly as she said she would. Ensor, get back to the flight deck. Tarrant, bring her back. There was a fierce determination in Blake's eyes that neither Tarrant nor Ensor had seen before. Blake aimed the gun again at Tarrant, and she moved closer to him. Now, Tarrant! Semele waited. It had been too long, and she should have been back aboard the ship by now. Arik's angry request for a report came through loud and clear on the pursuit ship's flight deck. 
Finally, Semele felt the uncomfortable feeling of teleportation begin. You failed, Arik. We have the ship, we have Aurak, and you no longer have me to do the Federation's bidding. Goodbye. The interior of the pursuit ship faded from her view, to be replaced by the teleport room aboard DSV-4. Blake was there to greet her with a warm smile that seemed to be wasted on the mutoid. Welcome back. Where is Ensor? I thought he was bringing me back. Don't worry about that. The important thing is that you're back safely. You need to destroy that ship. It is only 50 specials away and the explosion from the self-destruct mechanism could destroy us. Do we have control yet? Blake grabbed Orak. Let's get to the flight deck. Tarrant, Villa, can either of you work those weapons? I, I don't recognise the controls. Sorry, Tarrant? Neither do I. Orak, can you operate the weaponry systems? The weaponry systems are closed to external influences and can only be operated directly from the weaponry console or by Koyos. The fact I advised earlier... Orak, you realise if that ship blows up, then so does this ship and everything on it, including you. Have you made contact with Koyos yet? I am yet to make full contact with the ship's computer. In the meantime, there is a Federation communication attempting to make contact. I will broadcast it over the ship's communication system. This is Space Commander Arik. You have shown yourselves to the enemies of the Federation and will now face the consequences of your actions. You have a Federation fugitive on board, and despite you having an item we require, I have set the pursuit ship to self-destruct. As no doubt former Officer Semele can attest, a self-destruct mechanism on a Federation ship creates an explosion six times the force that the destruction of the ship by any other means would in order to eliminate any nearby enemies. As you are yet to destroy the pursuit ship or move your position, I have deduced that you cannot do so for some reason. The ship will self-destruct in 60 seconds from now and take you with it. Goodbye, Semele. I only regret that I cannot have you here in person to punish in a way that the betrayal of your duty deserves. The crew all looked at each other in turn. Set a countdown on the main screen, Tarrant. Why? What's the point? Do we really need to know how long we've got left? Do something, Tarrant! Orak! Blake! Do something! I don't know what else to do, Villa. Suggestions? Anybody? Blake felt her breathing becoming more laboured, the stress of the last few hours clearly now taking its toll. Orak, update on Koyos. Kindly stop interrupting my work. I am closing down. If I make contact with Koyos, you will be made aware. If not, then we shall all be made more than aware due to our destruction. Blake glanced numbly at the main screen. The countdown continued. Had she really come all this way, overcome all these difficulties, just to have it end this way? 22. She felt paralyzed, unable to make her brain function and assume command of the situation. Ensor walked away from his console seat to sit on the sofa in the middle of the flight deck. His calculating brain knew that there was nothing he or any of the others could do, and he felt surprisingly calm. After all, death was the final puzzle, and he now chose to face it with intellect overriding emotion, the way he had chosen to live his life to date. Meanwhile, Tarrant, on numerous occasions, started to speak, but no words came out. He never thought he would die waiting. He always thought his death would be swift, in battle or immediately, on his own terms. He kicked the console in front of him in frustration. Finally, they had got away from Gauda Prime only to face death now at the hands of the hated Federation. It was as if the ghosts of that final command room ambush on Gauda Prime had come to claim him once more. Villa was slumped at the weaponry console, staring at the screen in front of him, waiting for some divine intervention. He hid his face in his hands, so the others could not see the tears welling up in his eyes. Semele sat impassively in a console seat, no look of emotion on her face, no movement at all. 
Death was something she had already faced. Indeed, she had died once before. Losing her life held no fear for her as it did for the others. If she were to die 17. now, at least it was as a free individual and not as a pawn of the Federation. She knew she had deprived Arik and Lamia of something they desperately wanted, a weapon that would make the Federation even stronger. So she felt a strange sense of peace and contentment at her fate. All right, you're a useless box of lights. Villa jumped from his seat and made his way over to the panel underneath Koyos. He pulled the panel off the wall and started stripping out circuit boards, tossing them to one side frantically as he had once seen Avon do, in a desperate attempt to regain control of the Liberator so many years ago, when that ship had been taken over by the system. Villa, what are you doing? You'll wreck the controls! They're going to be wrecked anyway! Muttering, he pulled out a metallic box with numerous flashing lights and switches on it. Which one is it? Which one? Villa pressed a switch and ran back to his console. As he sat down, the console in front of him changed from a black to an illuminated Nine. screen that revealed numerous touch-activated controls that were now available to him. Eight. Villa stared at the console screen in front of him desperately trying to remember which controls had been where on the Liberator console. Seven. Then, through the alcoholic haze that clouded his brain, there was a sudden moment of clarity. Six. A memory from three decades ago. Five. He touched three controls on the screen in front of him in quick succession. Four. Suddenly, the oval-shaped main view screen to the right of Koyos stopped showing Blake's countdown, and instead, displayed the Federation pursuit ship, stationary, in space, a mere 50 spatials away. Villa touched his console once more. Three. Two. Two. The crew watched the screen in amazement as three laser beams seared their way from the turrets of DSV-4 and hit the Federation pursuit ship, which immediately erupted into thousands of fragmented pieces, far too small to cause real damage to their larger ship. Before the crew could take in what had just happened, a deep, booming voice filled the room, simultaneously accompanied by a brown hexagonal panel on the wall in front of them, coming alive in a sequence of yellow square and rectangular lights that flickered on and off in time with the address. Welcome, Del Tarrant. Welcome, Villa Restos. Your voice prints are already stored in our systems. Your species requires a computerized point of reference to operate DSP-4. This is your point of reference. I am Koyos. The voice was authoritative and almost headmasterly. The crew drew a large collective intake of breath. Aurak had made contact. Get us out of here quickly, Koyos. Just find a clear area of space. The engines changed pitch, and the crew felt the ship suddenly move forward. You three had better introduce yourselves to Koyos. Blake, Semele, and Ensor all walked towards the panel from which the ship's voice seemed to be broadcasting. One by one, they responded. I am Semele. I am Zach Ensor. I am Lou Blake. Koyos, record their voice prints and from now on respond to their commands. Confirmed. Your voice prints are now logged in the system. I will now respond to instructions from all of you. Contact has now been made with the Koyos computer. Yes, I think we noticed, Aurak. Thank you. Question is, was it Villa who saved us or was it Aurak? Blake didn't really expect an answer from anyone in particular. I'm a very modest man. So, of course, it was me. <laughs> modest? You never. Tarrant put an arm around Villa by way of thanking him for saving their lives. A communication tracer link discovered on destruction of the pursuit ship that had docked with this ship has now been terminated. Oh, so that's how they found us. Anyway... What are we, uh, naming this shiny new ship of ours? Vindictus. Ah, from the ancient Terran language. It's Latin for vengeance or revenge. Which is it for you, Blake? 
Ensor flashed a beaming smile that for once reached his brilliant blue eyes. Both. Koyos, acknowledge the ship's new name. Confirmed. Vindictus. Oh, how very liberating. Villa's remark left the rest of the crew unsure whether this was a deliberate reference to the past or not. How inspiring. Ensor turned his back on the rest of the crew and left the flight deck. The brief moment of relief and unfamiliar sense of camaraderie dissipating quickly for him. Glancing with contempt at the retreating figure of the tall, dark-haired man, Tarrant muttered under his breath, That one almost makes me miss Haven. Almost. Lake let out a deep breath, relieved that for the moment at least, no imminent crisis was looming over them. She looked around at the others. Since it looks like this ship is going to be our home for the foreseeable future, I think it's time to explore. Tarrant, Villa, would you do the honours since you may know the layout better than the rest of us? She gave them a brilliant smile that made her look much younger than her 32 years. Why not? I'm pretty curious myself to see how the Vindictus compares to the Liberator. Semele, will you join us? The Vindictus is your home too now. Blake looked over at the Mutoid, curious to see how she would behave now that the danger from the Federation was over. For the moment, at least. Semele stood up slowly, and Blake saw her properly for the first time, now that the heat of battle had ended. Semele's waist-length chestnut-brown hair come loose and now framed her narrow, oval face in flattering waves. With her short, straight nose, high cheekbones and translucent pale skin, the mutoid had an almost ethereal beauty that was at odds with her harsh, military garb. But it was Semele's eyes that were her most arresting feature. They were an unusual shade of silvery grey that seemed to shift into a darker emerald green in the reflection of the control panels their arm and shape tilting at the outer corners, giving her face a feline appearance. Blake couldn't decide whether this was more in keeping with a house cat or a tiger, however. Glancing over at Villa, Blake was amused to see that he also seemed to be appreciating Simile's slender yet curvaceous form as well, a strange mixture of admiration and fear playing across his features. As the mutoid joined the others at the entrance to the upper corridor, Blake took note that unlike Villa, Tarrant seemed to purposefully avoid looking at her. Recalling the older man's angry comments about vampires, Blake realised that Tarrant was a long way from accepting Semele's presence aboard the Vindictus, and that the situation may lead to some difficult moments to come. Blake had her own doubts about the wisdom of having a technologically modified human as part of the crew, but... Semele was obviously good in a fight, and undoubtedly had reason to hate the Federation as much, if not more, than the rest of them. Blake shook her head sharply, trying to shake off her anxious overthinking and concentrate on the wonders of the ship that fate had bestowed on her. She still couldn't quite believe her luck. A mere 24 hours earlier, she had been alone and friendless on a dangerous planet with no real plan or hope of finding a way to accomplish her mission. Now, she was on board the most technologically advanced ship in the galaxy, and if not exactly surrounded by friends, at least she was no longer alone. She noticed that Ensor was yet to rejoin the crew on the flight deck, and it had been over an hour, indicating he was obviously disinterested in the group's activities. Her instinct was to attempt to coax him into joining them, but she decided against it, having had enough tense conversation and persuasion for one day. Ensor seemed determined to keep his own counsel, and Blake found herself wondering if he would ever soften his demeanour towards her and the rest of the crew. As the group moved through the brightly lit, angular corridors of the Vindictus, Tarrant and Villa took turns pointing out features of the ship that were familiar to them. 
They paused at the entrance to a large room with hexagonal wall panels and several narrow beds with computer equipment attached. This must be the medical bay. Basic medicines, diagnostic equipment. You can probably perform brain surgery here if you know how. It'll be good enough to patch us up after a fight. Not far from the medical bay was a large open area with tables and chairs. The crew looked curiously at the alcoves in the walls of the hexagonal room. Food synthesizers. Not exactly fancy, but a damn sight better than what they fed us in the military. <laughs> or what we ate on GP. Remember the canned rations we salvaged off that Pandorian freighter? Oh, I was sick for a week. <laughs> well, that was more likely the bottles of Vandorian gin. But yes, life aboard this ship will definitely be luxurious compared to ours on GP. <laughs> for a moment, the two older men looked at each other, lost in their memories of the last 30 years. Reluctant to interrupt, but bursting with curiosity and excitement, Blake interjected. So we're completely independent? We can stay in space indefinitely without having to risk going to planets to repair or restock? Her spirits rose with each new revelation. Well, barring really serious medical situations or damage the self-repair systems can't deal with, then yes, we can pretty much avoid interaction with others and stay out of the Federation's reach. But that's not what you have planned, is it, Blake? We may have just met... But I feel like I know you better than you think. You're too much like him not to want. Villa's soft voice cut through Blake's thoughts like a knife. Villa, shut up. I'm tired. You're tired. Blake's tired. And this is no time for making decisions. I suggest we finish this tour, go to our quarters, and save any discussions on this topic until we've all had some rest. Blake was unsettled by the way Villa seemed to read her thoughts, and she fell silent as the group made their way through the corridor that exited the dining area. It was true. She hadn't left the only home she had ever known just to wander the galaxy hiding from the Federation. But could she ask others to follow her down the road of rebellion? Did she even have the right to ask it of them? Tarrant was right. They were all exhausted, and they all needed to rest. The group entered a large room that had multiple small alcoves in each wall. Inside each were clothes of every style and size imaginable. For a moment, Blake couldn't believe her eyes. It was the last thing she had expected to find. What the... why the clothing emporium? We always wondered that as well. I mean, why the altars would need food, clothes or medical care. Then we found out their guards and servants were human, so they had to keep them fed and in good working order. I mean, I assumed the clothes were there so they could send the humans to various planets without looking too out of place. Well, I'm not sure they always understood what looking out of place looks like. Villa held up a purple gown covered with what appeared to be several large gemstones. But most of the clothing is wearable, so you should be able to find something that suits you. As each of them wandered slowly around the alcoves, Blake watched the others, curiously observing their choices. She had a little interest in adornment for herself, but she felt that clothing often gave clues to the personality traits of others. Villa quickly grabbed several tops and pairs of trousers that were earthen tones, comfortable but unobtrusive. Perfect for a thief that wanted to blend into his surroundings, she mused. Tarrant seemed drawn to severely tailored dark clothing, almost uniform-like. Once a soldier, always a soldier, Blake smiled slightly to herself. Semele had paused for several moments after entering the room, unsure, as if she wasn't used to being able to make choices for herself. Blake watched the mutoid pull out several flowing gowns, which would have looked beautiful on her slender form, but then settled on a dark green, slightly iridescent jumpsuit, with faint touches of silver at the neckline and waist. It didn't matter what Semele chose, Blake thought wryly to herself. She would still look stunning. Quickly choosing several uncomplicated tops and jumpsuits of various colours for herself, Blake joined her companions as they headed once more into the corridor. 
I think that's enough for now. <sighs> Can everyone find the way to their sleeping quarters? As the other three nodded in assent, Tarrant abruptly turned and headed off to his quarters, obviously fed up with being a tour guide and eager to finally get some rest. Blake hung back for a moment as a sudden, unpleasant realisation entered her head. She beckoned to Villa, who, after a brief hesitation, walked over to where Blake stood. Villa, we've still got three dead bodies on board. Two altars and a mutoid. I... I don't think I can sleep knowing they're still here. Stupid, I know, but... Could you please put them in the airlock and send them off into space? i do it, but I, I don't know how it works or where things are yet. Tarrant seems exhausted, and I hate to ask you after all you've already done. She looked at the older man, an unspoken plea for understanding in her wide brown eyes. Fine, but the next unpleasant job is for Tarrant or that human computer, Ensor. I'm not going to be everyone's lackey on this ship. Not again. Thank you, Villa. For this and for everything. Blake enveloped Villa in a warm hug. At least you're nicer to hug than your cousin. And much prettier. You're a lot like him, you know. He had his faults, but he knew how to get people on his side. He trusted people, helped people. And to many, he was a hero. Yes, I can see him in you. A faint smile lit up on his face for a moment as he turned in the direction of the flight deck. Blake stood motionless for a moment, taking in what Villa had just said. Was she really so like her cousin? Villa's tribute made her feel inadequate, adding to the anxiety around her ability to live up to her cousin's legacy. A legacy, it seemed, she was now destined to follow. On the opposite side of the ship, Ensor was conducting his own personal tour. He quickly found sleeping quarters in what appeared to be a little-used area of the ship that was small and minimalist, but Ensor didn't mind. The room's real appeal lay in its distance from the more frequently used areas of the ship. Far from finding comfort in the proximity of other people, Ensor preferred to keep some distance between himself and the others. Initially, it hadn't mattered much to him, what his shipmates thought, or even what they were likely to do, because Ensor had planned to take Aurak and escape to the nearest civilized planet at the first opportunity. But, from his first sight of the teleport, the flight deck, with its seemingly sentient computer, Koyos, and the obviously advanced technology, Ensor began to rethink. This ship and its creators fascinated Ensor, as very little had in many years now, with the exception of finding Aurak, his grandfather's invention. He could no more walk away from the possibilities the Vindictus and its technology offered than a starving man could turn away from a full banquet. As he moved cautiously through the corridors, Ensor heard the voices of his shipmates. Hanging back, ship. he listened to the it. conversation between Villa and Blake. Ensor had no interest in the body of the mutoid, but the outer bodies, that was different. He needed them to discover how they interfaced with the ship, with Koyos, and the system that had created them. He wasn't going to learn anything if their remains were floating in the void of space. When Blake set off in the direction of her quarters, Ensor changed direction and quietly followed Villa to the flight deck.
Arik read the notification confirming the destruction of the Federation pursuit ship on the main console screen in Commissioner Lamia's office. The display also showed that the countdown for the ship's self-destruct had stopped a mere two seconds before detonation. Furthermore, he could see that the mutoid Semele's life signs indicated no injury. Arik gathered his thoughts and stood opposite Lamia, who was sat in her comfortable seat behind her desk. Commissioner, may I offer my verbal report? Space Commander, I do not need a verbal report from you to know that this mission has been a complete failure. Not only have we not retrieved ORAC, but we have also let an unknown group of rebels commandeer a powerful spaceship. We've lost a pursuit ship and three mutoid officers... The mutoid officer Semele is the reason for this failure. Your precious new batch of newly modified vampires are not only unable to react like troopers, but they're also prone to insubordination and treason. Your initial assessment of the requirements was, and I quote, a simple pickup mission. A team of three mutoids, as they were dispensable, aboard a standard pursuit ship would suffice. Oh, and as for your later request to take a team of troops out there, well, they would never have made it in time. We may well have had a faulty mutoid, an extremely rare and incalculable occurrence, but it is you that specified the requirements of this mission, and as per protocol, I followed your military assessment for what was a military matter. My report will be submitted on our behalf, but don't worry. I will make sure that you are not totally held responsible for this travesty. You are dismissed, Space Commander. Lamia flicked her hand disdainfully to dismiss Arik. She had ensured her position of authority for now, but Arik found it insufferable to accept that a bureaucrat should have any authority over him when dealing with military matters. The ambiguity over where the chains of command for the military and the administration overlapped, and who had ultimate jurisdiction, was epitomized by Commissioner Lamia's position at the head of the expansion program, and this enraged Arik. He believed there was a place for military and a place for diplomacy, but no place for them blurring into each other. There was a moment of awkward silence before Arik saluted, turned, and left. Lamia knew that her working relationship with one of the best space commanders in the fleet may well be damaged now, but if so, it had been necessary to retain her authority. Arik strode just a few paces down the corridor before turning around and marching purposefully back into the Commissioner's office. Lamia looked up in surprise. Arik, aware that he still had temporary authority granted to him by the SI, brushed Lamia aside, opening a command channel and pressing a switch on the console in front of her. This is Acting Commissioner Arik giving a direct command order to all Federation officers. All mutoid officers are now declared to be untrustworthy and are to be destroyed immediately. As quickly as he had entered, Arik stormed out again. Lamia composed herself and quickly opened a direct communication link with the SI. Supreme Imperator, can you relieve the rank of Commissioner and temporarily suspend Space Commander Arik for insubordination, reversing that last order? I already have, and I expect you to be more careful next time. Lamia calmly sat back in her chair and opened another communication channel. Space Commander Vordan, this is Commissioner Lamia. Are you and your squadron still situated in Auron space? Yes, Commissioner. I have three pursuit ships at my command, as you instructed. Excellent. As planned, get to Gouda Prime Space as quickly as possible and find that ship, but do not attack. Stay out of detector range until you receive further orders. Is that understood? Understood, Commissioner. Vordan, out. Lamia took a deep breath and sighed, wondering why, in order to succeed, it seemed she had to do everything herself.
The corridors of the Vindictus were eerily silent as Villa made his way to the flight deck. Everyone else has retired to their nice comfy quarters, haven't they? Everyone except me. Always was a sucker for a pretty face and a sad story. Villa, that's always been your downfall. He took a longer than usual swig from his hip flask. It wasn't as if disposing of dead bodies was much worse than the things he had done on Gauda Prime, and at least here, there was a nice, comfortable and private room for him. No more trying to sleep through Tarrant's snores, trapped in that filthy, half-buried troop carrier. Villa slipped the trusty flask back into his pocket and patted it lovingly. Whatever happened now, he was at least off that miserable rock. Hensor followed Villa carefully and quietly, although, judging by the number of times the older man paused to take a drink from the ever-present flask, Hensor was quite sure that a full troop of Federation soldiers could have snuck up on him. As he made his way slowly down the corridor, Hensor thought about the best way to approach the situation. Just because Villa was a drunk didn't mean his suspicions wouldn't be aroused by the younger man's sudden willingness to help. Despite Villa's sometimes clownish behaviour, Ensor recognised the keen intelligence behind the façade. Ensor had to play this very carefully, and Villa, like most thieves, was probably extremely good at reading other people, possibly almost as good as Ensor was himself. As the man approached the flight deck, Ensor stayed in the shadows to observe. Walking slowly over to the bodies of the mutoid and the Alta, Villa stared at them for a moment, and then walked over to the sofa area and slumped down, taking yet another drink as he did so. Oh, what the hell? Everyone's asleep but me. Pff, those two aren't going anywhere. No need to push myself too hard. It's been a long day after all. Ensor decided that this was the moment, and he approached Villa nonchalantly. Villa, what are you doing still up? I'd have thought you would have gone to bed like the rest of them. I could say the same for you, Ensor. What are you doing, prowling around? I'm not tired. And well, this ship, the technology, it's fascinating. I've been exploring a bit on my own. Oh, good. Another one in love with computers. Well, you're welcome to them. Never trusted machines much myself. I have always found them far more trustworthy than humans. At least you can usually predict what computers will do. For a moment, the two men sat in silence, Villa staring into space, Ensor watching him intently. You didn't answer me. Why are you awake? You're obviously not interested in exploring the ship, and you're clearly exhausted. Favour for Blake. She asked me to get rid of those two stiffs over there and the one in the teleport. Didn't have the heart to refuse her. Ah, our self-appointed leader already delegating, I see. Well, since I'm going to be up for a few more hours and you're about to drop, why don't you let me take care of our unwelcome guests? Why are you being so accommodating all of a sudden? You don't strike me as the altruistic type. You're right. I never do anything for purely selfless reasons. Okay, I'll admit it. I want to check out a few more areas of the ship, and operating the airlock will give me an excuse to play with some of the ship controls. I suspect Blake and your friend Tarrant aren't going to let me touch much else in the near future. You're not wrong about that. Tarrant's already acting like he owns the place. Oh, he always was bossy, never letting me touch anything mechanical. Me! able to open any lock in the galaxy, I ask you. Alcohol and exhaustion brought out his irritation, especially when he considered everyone else was resting comfortably. All right then, why not? If you want to stay awake all night and mix with computers and dead alters and mutoids, you're welcome to. I'm going to bed. The older man stood up, taking a moment to find his balance and sketched a brief if unsteady bow towards Ensor, before making his way up the stairs to the corridor without looking back.
As Ensor watched Villa wobble off into the corridor, he walked towards the corpses of the mutoid Camilla and Alta 23. Crouching down, he inspected each body in turn, the way a pathologist might undertake the early observational stages of an autopsy. Then, Ensor moved over to Aurak and slid the key into place to activate it. Aurak, what information do you have on the cybernetic, genetic and intellectual programming of Federation mutoids? I do not understand the relevance of the query. I have, however, studied the mutoid form in detail, as information is readily available within the Federation databanks. I have full knowledge of mutoid physiology, even the most recent versions, such as your fellow crew member, Simile. Would any sinew of the dead mutoid we currently have on the flight deck be of any use to us? The question is morbid, but fascinating. Since I have all the information we may need from my studies, and the mutoid is now dead beyond resuscitation, the body is of no use for practical or research purposes. Ensor smiled at the ease in which Orak had read his intentions. I'm glad you understand my reason for questioning, Orak. Cybernetic intelligence is as interesting to me as I'm sure it is to you, and the collection of information regarding the enhancement of artificial intelligence capabilities such as you are never given the priority that they deserve. Are you expecting a reply? No, I was merely thinking aloud. Then kindly don't. Our relationship would be best served if you kept your requirements succinct and unambivalent. Orak spoke sharply and gave the impression of a weary professor fed up with questioning from an uneducated student. Ensor laughed quietly to himself at the response, recognizing the manner of his late grandfather which he had heard in recorded research and lectures that his father had kept. I have the same question in relation to the other two bodies we have on board. The Elters are creations of the system, which is a highly advanced technological race. They have only limited information regarding their kind. Therefore, an in-depth study would be fascinating and would fill an unacceptable gap in my knowledge. My thoughts exactly. Ensor wasted no time in making his way to the medical facilities, where he wheeled out a trolley used to manoeuvre sick or injured patients. He was aware that teleporting bodies into deep space could create a nearby explosion, and, not being an expert on the body contents, he decided it was prudent to use the airlock housed near the docking station deep in the bowels of the ship. Ensor loaded the trolley with the heavier-than-expected mutoid body and wheeled it to the airlock. Thankfully, the trolley was fitted with a propulsion system, so it took little physical force to move, even with the body loaded. Ensor opened the large airlock, which was a perfectly square room at least 20 meters long. He braced himself, lifting the body off the trolley, and dumped it, closing the door again. Pressing the eject switch, Ensor watched the external door slide open and the body fly off, sucked into deep space. He noted that the activity had been logged on a console just to the side of the control panel and smirked wryly, as this suited his purposes perfectly. Because the airlock was big enough to have housed all three bodies at once, and its use had now been registered, nobody would have any reason to believe anything other than all three bodies having been sent into the darkness during the recorded activity, just as Blake had requested. On his way back to the flight deck, he stopped in the teleport to collect the body of Alta 45. It was far lighter than a normal human corpse, and this triggered his curiosity. With the precision of a surgeon, he cut a small slit in the left wrist with a scalpel that was stored within the trolley. Ensor watched in amazement, as, instead of blood, a clear substance, the texture of glue, oozed slowly out of the wound. He smiled to himself, thinking that this alone justified the need to further experiment on the Alters, easily loading the second body of Alta 23 onto the medical trolley. Ensor changed direction, pushing the trolley towards his quarters. He had discovered that his room was one of two sparse and minimalistic patient rooms situated alongside the medical bay. The fact that his room was not a proper living quarters didn't bother Ensor in the slightest, it had all he needed, and meant he could keep a distance from the rest of the crew. 
the rooms had temperature control capability, meaning they could also be used as cryogenic storage chambers, which suited the task of storing the bodies perfectly. Ensor placed the two outer bodies in room number two, laying them both carefully next to each other on the bed. He pressed the control panel that slid the door closed and then set the temperature control to its lowest setting. Ensor then pressed a switch on the small communication device that was situated next to the entrance. Koyos, this is Ensor. Lock patient room two situated in the medical unit. Authority to lock and unlock this room is to be mine and mine alone. No one else is to be given access. Do you understand? Confirm. Information. This is a subcategory Q instruction with no countermand. Please confirm this meets your requirements. Yes, confirmed. Thank you, Koyos. A wave of tiredness accompanied the sense of achievement that suddenly overcame Ensor. He retreated to his quarters, removing only his footwear and climbed straight into bed, where he fell instantly into his usual deep, dreamless sleep. Ensor awoke earlier than the rest of the crew. Instead of making his way to get some breakfast or to the flight deck, he eagerly entered patient room two after adjusting the temperature. Setting Orak on a bench near the bed, he noticed there was no wound or incision mark whatsoever where he had cut the wrists of Alta 45. The skin was completely smooth and unmarked. Orak, the incision I made yesterday on the altar has totally healed. Can you explain why? I would think the reason for the healing is obvious, even to you. All right, let's play along with your superiority complex. I don't know why the wound is healed, and I need your superior intellect to explain it to me. Very well. It is obvious that the outer and beings... so this is Blake. Please join the rest of us on the flight deck and bring Orak with you. It is not your personal computer and is to be kept on the flight deck. Out. As I was saying, the reason for... This can wait. We best keep up appearances for now. Ensor locked patient room two, setting the room temperature carefully. He walked onto the flight deck and placed Orak on the unit in the centre. The crew were sat at individual consoles, having each freshened up and taken a change of clothes. Blake sat in the centre, Semele was stationed at the pilot's console while Villa sat at the weapons console, the same seat he had frequented on board the Liberator. Tarrant walked towards the tactical station. Ensor, who was yet to change his filthy clothes, sat himself at the only station left which monitored communications and system functionality, observing that the crew had subconsciously moved into roles within the group. Blake got out of her seat and moved towards Orak. Then she rather nervously addressed the crew, impatiently brushing away the usual stray hair that had broken free of her ponytail. Thank you all for gathering here and for helping us get away from GP and the Federation. We have been thrown together, and while I don't expect you to follow me, I hope that we can find a way to work as a team and help each other get to wherever we want to go. If you want to leave the Vindictus at any point, then please just say." Villa watched Blake, holding the crew's attention, just like her cousin had, he thought. She had the same authentic nature, endearing her to other people with an underlying, intense magnetism. To be honest, I don't see where else there is to go. So staying here is our only option. I'll go along with the greater good if it makes sense, but don't expect me to fall in line if it doesn't. That's all I'll say. I'm only ever along for the ride, and I'm happy to stay out of harm's way as much as possible, Blake. I mean, I can operate the teleport, look after Orak, put up the flare shields, maybe even fire some blasters, that kind of thing. I'm not looking for glory. 
I am here to survive. I am an outcast from the Federation and from society. I will do what is needed to stay alive and provided I can meet my needs, my being here will help you to survive as well. What are your needs, Semele? You are aware of the needs of a mutoid. I have supplies of serum that will require replenishment as time goes on. This is what I need in the same way that you must have food and drink. Tarrant looked at Semele with a cold stare and then addressed Blake. She's a mutoid, Blake. Not like one I've ever seen, but still a mutoid. I've never liked mutoids and never will. I'd drop her off at the nearest port. It's not personal, Semele, but you'd kill any of us if you ran out of serum and needed to feed, and that makes you an unacceptable threat. He looked for support among the rest of the crew, but to his dismay, all that was forthcoming was a short period of silence. She helped us all back there, Tarrant. She has the same right to be here as you, Tarrant. And even though the ship is a lot like Liberator, it isn't Liberator. Semele stays. Unless anyone else objects? Blake looked deliberately at Ensor, who shrugged his shoulders. I don't need safety in numbers. Semele can be here until she decides not to be. I am here until I decide not to be. That's how I see it, Blake. Now you didn't bring us all here to discuss our motives. What do you want? Blake turned her back on the crew for a moment, let out a shaky breath, and smiled to herself. The conversation had gone better than expected. She turned back to face the crew and hunched over Aurak before again addressing them. We are all facing a Federation on the advance. They have now moved in on Morphenial, having taken Agrava and Zegla V recently. They are achieving success through a diplomatic, military and drug-induced oppression of non-aligned worlds. They call it the Expansion Program, led by one Commissioner Lamia. She's a callous, power-obsessed strategist who will think nothing of wiping out entire populations to achieve her aims. The most alarming asset they are using is an addictive pacification drug called Pylene 74. Hold on. Pylene, did you say? We came across Pylene 50 on Helitrix decades ago. But the Helots sabotaged production and mass-produced an antidote. I thought its use had been suppressed? It was, but a lot has happened since then. Aurak, can you give us a brief update on the history of Pylene 74, please? Pylene 74 is developed directly from Pylene 50, which was invented by the scientist Forbus and was intended to be used homeopathically as a muscle relaxant. When administered at 100 times normal dosage, it induced total docility and obedience, blocking the production of adrenaline. It was also observed to reinforce an individual's work ethic. The impact of Pylene 50 was immediate with no side effects. Forbus also developed a vaccine against the effects of Pylene 50 and the need to repeatedly manufacture the drug due to its fragile enzyme bonds that meant the pacification program was abandoned. Further development of the vaccine on Betafol rendered Pylene 50 totally ineffective. Thank you for the history lesson, Orak, but what has that got to do with the here and now? Pylene continued to be developed in secret by Federation scientists on Earth. Large-scale experimentation on sections of the population were undertaken on many Federation planets in return for assets and personal wealth. The largest publicly scrutinized failure was Pylene 62 on the Mars colony, which is when the addictive element of shadow was first added to the drug. This caused an almost immediate dependence, ensuring the population's continued use. However, Many of those subjected to Pylene 62 died of shadow poisoning within months. The Federation officially attributed the deaths as the effects of an airborne virus unique to Mars. Are you going to get to the point? <laughs> that is Aurak being brief. Kindly stop interrupting. The Federation has never given up on its pacification program development, and on numerous occasions has widely used different versions of the drug. The most notable being Pylene 72, almost 11 years ago, which was used on nine different planets. Unverified data suggests increased death rates of up to 32% and reduced birth rates of up to 28% are attributed to this version. As a result, Pylene 74 has since been successfully developed and mass tested on over 4 million people only nine months ago on Agrava. Now, the entire population of 17 million is under its influence, including children as young as three, 
even though there were known side effects from previous versions of the drug that only became apparent some years after it was administered. After the initial dose of Pylene 74, which is administered by forced injection when people don't comply, the population is now willingly taking it in pill form on a daily basis, keeping them reliably under the drug's influence. Borak delivered the chilling explanation to the crew, who were shocked into silence. Blake wondered if she had shared too much, whether the crew recognized the sheer dystopian authoritarian and inhumane nature of what the Federation was now doing. And if so, did they even care? It is sickening. Utterly sickening. No free-thinking, unaligned planet is safe, and it's these planet's authorities we must reach since we have access to information they do not. If we can organize them and create a rebellion against the Federation, we can fight. Blake delivered her rallying cry quietly, but with an intensity in her eyes and voice that seemed to cast a spell over the crew. What can five of us do exactly? Oh, and of course, Orak and Koyos here. Why would any of these planets listen to a group of renegades like us? He does have a point, Blake. What, so we've come this far and now we just give up? If so, we may as well choose our planet, line up for our dose of Pylene 74, and surrender to a life of servitude. Well, not for me, no way. I agree with Blake. We have to try. For the sake of all free minds, we have to try. Though I say, let's pick some targets and cause some real damage. Tarrant was shocked by how passionately he delivered his view, but what he had heard from Blake and Orak had revolted him to his core. I have been conditioned to accept a life of servitude, but have managed to break that conditioning, or at least I believe I have. I simply cannot be caught as I will be reconditioned and I do not want anyone else to suffer a life of forced compliance. I agree the Federation is sick and it needs to be fought. It could do so much good but always chooses the authoritarian way, the wrong path. I am with Blake, totally, but blasting small parts of the Federation will not change anything as they will simply regroup and we will never catch up. It has been a while since you were on the payroll, Tarrant. And things have changed. Any action is action. Let's just agree on that. I do agree. Semele gave a smile, emphasizing how beautiful she was. Although, surprisingly, the smile was directed towards Ensor. She got up and moved over to Ensor's station, placing her hand on the console in front of him. What do you think, Ensor? She stared straight at him with her silvery, grey eyes. Ensor who was used to the attention of attractive people, felt no need to react, though he did allow a wry smile, comfortable in the knowledge that there was at least one member of the crew he may be able to manipulate. He moved away casually, towards the centre of the flight deck. Semele was taken aback, as feelings she did not understand washed over her. She felt extremely uncomfortable and uneasy, wondering if her conditioning was failing to a larger extent than even she had thought. She rushed back to her console like a rejected, embarrassed teenager. Villa watched with some jealousy, entranced as he was with Semele, and wondering why the cold, robotic man should yet again attract the girl. He tried to ease the tension. Look, I'm not one for rocking the boat. If we're all in it together, or most of us even, then I'm happy. I'm not one to go it alone. Oh, it's just not in my nature. We need each other. Or at least I think we do. Tarrant looked at Villa and shook his head while smirking, amused by Villa's constant need for companionship. Looks like it's just you, Ensor. So, will you join us? Of course. I don't know why you ever doubted it. I only asked why anyone would take any notice of us. Maybe in future I will remember to keep open-ended questions to myself if only to prevent unnecessary emotional outbursts. Information. The security division on the planet Xpar has advised the central security system that the prisoner Lou Blake has escaped and is missing. 
as a known political activist likely to garner support for historical family reasons, the capture of Blake is reported as a priority matter for all Federation officers in an order issued by Commissioner Lamia. Blake's heart began pounding. Does the Federation have any information on my whereabouts? That information is not available. Orak? It is reasonable to assume that anyone who aided your escape is subject to interrogation. Your movements, at least as far as Gar Prime, can and will be traced. If the reason for your mission to collect me is revealed, then your presence on board this ship will also become evident. How convincing are the interrogators on X-Bar? My brother and his interrogators can be very convincing. Concern for her mother and the men who had helped her escape added to Blake's growing anxiety. Tarrant noted the mention of Blake's brother, but decided not to question further. There was nothing more difficult than families at war, as he knew only too well. It's time to get moving. Koyos, set a course for Zadith. Please state speed. Standard by seven. Tarrant smiled at Blake, sensing her weariness as she slumped on the sofas in the centre of the flight deck. What's the transit time, Koyos? Transit time to Zadith is 16 hours, 4 minutes and 43 seconds at our current speed. Well, I'm going to clean up and get some new clothes. Ensor walked past Blake, towards Orak. As I said earlier, Ensor, Orak stays here with us. Ensor decided to ignore Blake and moved to pick up Orak anyway. He was stopped in his tracks by Tarrant. As she said, Ensor... Orak stays with us. Ensor said nothing, but turned his back and slowly walked off the flight deck. I can't see him being much help at the moment. I'll stay on the flight deck. The rest of you take it in turns at the monitoring station, please. In between getting some food and rest. I'll get you some food. Tarrant, stay away from Ensor. Oh, I will. I'm hungry and tired, not spoiling for a one-sided fight. <laughs> Information. Vindictus is now in orbit of the planet Zadith. The crew gazed at the planet on the oval-shaped viewer in the centre of the flight deck. It was eerily similar to Earth, covered in vast expanses of purple-tinted water, interspersed by mountainous land masses and smaller islands. All right, we're here. Are you going to give us a bit more information, Blake? Or do you plan on sending us in blind? Yes, Blake. A bit more information would be helpful. I don't remember much about my time at the Federation Space Academy, but I do recall cadets talking about the inhabitants of Zadith, and not in friendly terms. Something about never engaging one of their warriors in hand-to-hand -hand combat, not if you wanted to survive to see your next meal. Blake absent-mindedly pushed back a stray tendril of hair and glanced around, worried that she was taking an unnecessary risk putting the others in harm's way just to implement her own personal vendetta against the Federation. The prowess of the warriors of Zadith is not an exaggeration, although there aren't very many records of encounters with them. However, the few that do exist make it clear that things did not end well for those trying to engage them in battle. Wonderful. They sound like just the sort of people I've spent my entire career trying to avoid. Ignoring Villa's commentary, Blake continued despite knowing that what she was about to tell the crew was unlikely to increase their enthusiasm for her plan. However, she was keenly aware that to withhold any information would put the mission and everyone involved at even more risk. Blake stood next to Koyos, as if somehow seeking backup from the artificial intelligence. Zalith has always followed a policy of strict isolation and never became part of the Federation, having very little to do with outsiders. It's rich in Ilmenite, and so how long it can remain free is questionable. 
I think now is an opportune time to offer them a potential multiplanetary alliance to help withstand the inevitable Federation interference. Oh, I'm sure they'll jump at the opportunity. An alliance of exactly how many is it? Oh yes, zero planets. We have to start somewhere, Enzo. That's why Zadith is perfect. Fiercely autonomous, and because of their warrior code, unlikely to give in to Federation bribes or threats. As Blake looked round at the members of the Vindictus crew, she gave an inward sigh, wondering if Roger Blake had ever felt this discouraged. Ensor, with his studied disinterest, Villa constantly supping from his flask, Tarrant treating her like a ten-year-old, and Semele? Well, Blake couldn't read anything behind her lovely, impassive face. She wondered if Ensor noticed Semele's obvious attempts at flirtation. He was also impossible to read. She wandered across the flight deck and stood next to Aurak, once again seeking silent support from anything by a member of her crew. According to Aurak, Zadith has had very limited contact with other worlds, largely due to their strict religious beliefs and warlike temperament. The few civilizations that have been unfortunate enough to try and conquer them or even initiate contact have been brutally dealt with by their military. But we're going to be welcomed with open arms by these maniacs because our hearts are pure and our mission noble. Ensor shook his head in disbelief. Unnecessary heroism was one thing that could shake him out of his usual cynical disinterest. It's basically a feudal society, much like the Middle Ages in Earth's early history. Control of the planet is divided among several clans, each one ruled by the highest ranking male of the family, the Dane of the clan. These ruling families have absolute power over the common people and form part of the governing body of Zadith answerable only to the High King. Blake paused, knowing that the next part of Orak's report would be the most concerning to the crew. One particular challenge is their strict adherence to their religion. Everything is centred around the worship of Baram, a sort of universal life force. One of the central tenets of this religion is an extreme distrust of anything technological, which includes artificial intelligence and biological life forms that have been altered or enhanced in any way which they refer to as abominations. Blake looked at the crew, gauging their reactions, and in particular that of Semele. What might have been a frown briefly marred the mutoid's face, quickly settling back into Semele's usual calm and untroubled countenance. So, does this mean that the Zadathans have no technology, and no capability of space travel? Well, that would make them extremely vulnerable to invasion, no matter how invincible their warriors may be. Fighting skills can only do so much against laser weapons. They have minimal technology, and that includes space travel and the use of their advanced weapons, but they rarely engage in it and prefer to rely on the skills of their warriors rather than computer intelligence. Well, I'm sure we all love a good lecture. It still does not answer the question of why these religiously fanatical technophobes, who evidently hate everyone who isn't from their backward planet, would want to ally themselves with us. Because, Ensor. These people are not as monolithic in their beliefs as reported. Aurak has intercepted several intraplanetary communications that indicate a growing faction of younger clan leaders who feel that the planet can no longer maintain its isolationist ways, not with the Federation expanding exponentially. I've been in contact with Callan, the younger brother of the Dane of the Vajrasan clan, and he seems open to the idea of an alliance, and what's more, he has the ear of the High King. We're not asking them to suddenly let outsiders onto their planet or violate their religious beliefs, just to be willing to come to the aid of other planets who also value their independence equally. Well, it seems you've already decided to pursue this endeavour without any input from me, so I see no reason why I should spend any more time here discussing the idea's obvious flaws. Also, I don't see that I'm needed on Zadith, since I am a computer expert and they don't use computers very often which means I am neither needed nor welcomed there. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have more important things to do. Ensor gave an unpleasant smile and left the flight deck. 